I will be reading from Romans 3.23. For all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The more, this morning's lesson is titled, uh, I'm Doing Fine. You know, a lot of times when we come in, walk through the doors here at the church, we are asked, how are you doing? Or how are you feeling? And a lot of times we might say, we're, I'm doing fine. Or we're feeling fine. Sometimes that's not the case, though. If we, we may be saying we've, we're feeling fine, but maybe we're not feeling very well at all. Maybe we're like the happy poet who looked at the beautiful flowers and listened to the birds singing and then ended his poem with, all is right with the world. But right now, we may think that all is not right with the world. With all the confusion about the coronavirus and the political turmoil going on in our country, how can we say all is right with the world? Well, I have an answer to that question. Because Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, we're feeling, we should feel pretty good about that. We should be rejoicing every day that we are Christians and Jesus is our Lord and Savior. I'd like to share a story about that would go along with her lesson today. Sometimes we tend to be like the fellow, and maybe you've heard this story before, but sometimes we may tend to be like the fellow who showed up for a court hearing about an accident he, in which he had been involved in. His arm was in a cast. There were bandages all over him, and the exposed parts of his body were clearly bruised and scratched. Looking rather surprised, the judge asked about his injuries, and he replied, <clears throat> Judge, I'm not doing very well. I have cuts and stitches all over me, and I'm feeling awful. The judge looked puzzled. He said, I don't understand. The accident report filed by the officer said that at the time of the accident, you told him you were do doing just fine. He said, well, judge, I know that's what I said, but let me explain. I was driving my pickup and pulling a trailer. In the back of the pickup was my old dog, Shep, and the mule was in the trailer, and my mule was in the trailer. And all of a sudden, an 18-wheeler sideswiped me, knocking me off the road. My pickup and trailer rolled over and over, and we ended up at the bottom of a big embankment. The next thing I remember, a police officer was picking his way through the wreckage. I saw him stop and examine my mule. The mule, his mule was in suffering, and, and uh, the officer pulled out his pistol and put, him, put the mule out of his suffering and shot the mule. Next, he got to where his old dog Shep was lying and seeing that his dog was suffering. He shot Shep, too. Now, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> then he walked over to me and asked, How are you? And I said, I'm doing just fine. So we may think that's a ridiculous story. And we may understand why someone says, I'm, I am doing fine, even while experiencing uh, physical aches and pains. But when it comes to our spiritual life, most of us would probably assume that we are doing fine, when in reality we're not doing so well at all. 
were finding it difficult to follow in Jesus' footsteps. But what if there was a test we could measure the level of our commitment to Christ and of our discipleship? Well, there is such a test. So look in first, or, uh, John chapter 13, John chapter 13, verses 31 through 38. In these verses, Jesus provides us with the marks of true discipleship and a measuring stick to show us how well we are doing spiritually. So here's the scene. It is his last evening with his apostles before his arrest and crucifixion the, the next day. And they're all together in the upper room eating the Passover meal. The evening began with Jesus washing their feet, teaching them humility. Then they began to eat. And while they were eating, Jesus says that one of, the, one of them that night will betray him. Well, this immediately causes questioning and turmoil. And in the midst of all that, Judas quietly leaves. So when we begin verse 31 of John 13, Judas is gone, leaving only Jesus and the other 11 apostles. Then Jesus begins to talk about what it means to be his disciple. And he mentions three characteristics of what it takes to follow him. The first characteristic is a desire to glorify God. First of all, Jesus tells him that a mark of discipleship is a desire to glorify God. Listen to verse 31. As after Judas had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to be glorified. And it is evident that he is talking about his own crucifixion. But how can any glory come out of, of that? How can glory come out of the Son of God hanging on an old rugged bloody cross. How can glory come out of suffering and death? There's just one way. On the, cry, on the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. On the cross, he became the sacrifice to redeem us from all the sins and separate us from God. On the cross, he built a bridge between man and God so that we could be together again. Jesus said, I'm going to be glorified, but there is more. God will also be glorified through me. So what a strange statement. How could God be glorified through Jesus Christ? Well, again, the answer is found in the cross. On the cross, Jesus reveals once again what God is really like. On the cross, we see the love and mercy of God. On the cross, we see the grace and the justice of God. On the cross, we see the righteousness and the holiness and the power of God. It is all dis displayed there, and Jesus willingly gave himself upon the cross so that we may see that all. Jesus is telling us, whenever we show the world the love and mercy and grace in our lives, then God is being glorified through us. There was a man one time who was invited to be a guest speaker at a men's retreat. And as he arrived at the camp, the first man to greet him was a small, 
frail-looking man. His first impression of that man was not very good. But sometimes first impressions aren't always accurate. So this man and, uh, and about 30 other men were together all Friday night and Saturday. They talked and they prayed together and they shared their testimonies. An amazing thing became apparent to him as the men told their stories. As each one told about coming to know and accept Christ as their Savior, almost without exception, everyone someplace in his testimony mentioned this small, frail-looking man. Someplace along the way, this little man had influenced, influenced each one of them. And they had come to Christ at least partially because of him. And God was glorified as a result. So how are we doing? Are we busy trying to glorify ourselves? Or are we trying to glorify God? That is the first test. The second mark of discipleship is found in verse 34. Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So God's word says that the world will know we are Christians by our love. That makes me think of the song that we sing. We they will know we are Christians by our love. Not by the amount of money we have or by the knowledge of God's word. Christ wants his followers to be known for their love by how, the, by how they minister to one another. So maybe it's helping a divorced person know that God hates divorce but loves the divorcees. Maybe it's in comforting someone who is hurting from the loss of a loved one or having struggles at a task of putting together a blended family to be what God wants it to be. So let's get back to the place where people can truly say about us, behold those Christians, how they love one another. So number two was an unfailing love for one another. <clears throat> the third one is an unswerving loyalty to Jesus. Look at the verses uh, 36 through 38. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow me now but you will follow later. And then Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So how loyal are we? Do we have an unswerving loyalty to Jesus? You see, there's a difference between proclaiming your loyalty and practicing it. Peter was always proclaiming his loyalty, but not always willing to practice it. And I think we're very much like he was. Jesus asked, you're going to die? Or Peter asked, you're going to die, Lord? Well, if you die, I'll die with you. So it's easy to, it's easy to say, I would die for the Lord. 
But when they are getting out the nails to drive through your hands and feet, it's a whole different situation. Jesus asks, are you really willing to die for me, Peter? Let me show you how loyal you are. Before morning comes, you will deny me not once, but three different times. Again, the Lord asks, you're going to be loyal to me? Okay, Peter, watch and pray with me. As they were entering the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus said, I'm going to go a little further into the Garden to pray. Watch and pray. But Peter, along with the rest of the apostles, quickly fell fast asleep. So was Peter going to be loyal to Jesus? How close was Peter going to follow? Luke tells us that when the soldiers arrested Jesus and took him out of the Garden of Gethsemane, that Peter followed at a distance. Well, I'm not surprised. I have a, a feeling that if I had been there, I would have exactly been like Peter. And maybe you too. So Peter followed at a distance. And when you follow Jesus at a distance, you usually end up in the wrong crowd. That is exactly what happened to Peter. He ended up that night in the high priest's courtyard just outside where Jesus was being put on trial. Now the Apostle John was in the courtroom with Jesus, but Peter was out in the courtyard with all those who had, been, had a part in arresting Jesus. One of them asked him, you're the one, you're one of the Nazarene's followers, aren't you? Peter said, no, not me. Three times he was asked, and three times he denied even knowing Jesus. Peter found out that it was a lot easier to proclaim his loyalty than to practice it. One time a mother wrote, My th three-year-old was on my heels everywhere I went. And whenever I stopped to do something and then turned back around, I'd almost trip over him. Time and again, I patiently suggested fun activities to keep him occupied. But he simply smiled an innocent smile and said, oh, that's all right, mommy. I'd rather be in here with you. Then he continued to bounce happily alone behind me. After stepping on his toes for the fifth time, I began to lose my patience. When I asked him why he was acting this way, he looked up with a sweet green, with sweet green eyes and said, Well, Mommy, my Sunday school teacher told me to walk in Jesus' footsteps. But I can't see him, so I'm walking in yours. So this morning, are we walking in the footsteps of Jesus? Is your life and my life one that brings glory to God? Is your life one that is filled with love for the family of God and for His people? Is your life one of unswerving loyalty to Jesus? It doesn't make any difference how many crosses we may, we may wear or how many bumper stickers we have on our car. What really matters is our commitment to follow Jesus. Yet like Peter, all too often we fall short in this area. Do you remember what happened that night? After the third time that Peter denied Jesus, the rooster crowed. Just as Jesus said it would. I suppose when that rooster crowed, Suddenly, Peter realized what he had done. 
He had so boldly proclaimed, I'll die with you. But when he was confronted with danger, he denied Jesus again and again. Then he ran out of the courtyard and wept. Sometimes I'm afraid that's the way we react too. We have fallen short. We've not always been what we ought to be, and we realize it. We've been so bold and so open in some ways. Then suddenly we see ourselves as we really are. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none perfect, no, not one, with the exception of Jesus Christ. But you see, we know a lot more about Peter than just that. We know that he became a leader of the church as it began in Jerusalem and spread throughout the world. We hear, we hear a great deal more about Peter in his life and also about Paul, too. Paul was a great persecutor of Christians who became one of the greatest Christians of all time. Why? Because Jesus gave Paul a second chance, too. And how Jesus treated Peter and Paul, he now offers to treat us. Just because you fell short doesn't mean that he has stopped loving you. That's the whole idea behind the cross. We can start all over and begin anew. So are we willing to start again? That is what Jesus is asking. And it's our decision to make. So he invites us and he waits. Do you want to be my disciple? Jesus asks. Here are the marks. Are you willing to display them so that the world can know that you are my disciple? I pray this morning that you will decide for Jesus. That is the message this morning. If we can help you in any way, Please come as we stand and sing our invitation song.